Working on the engine bay, I'm gonna refer you to the budget EF that you'll see on the VTech Academy. That's another video that I'm linking down below. Uh, if you need any help figuring out what you need to do in the bay, that, that's a great video to watch. In that video, we removed most of the stuff and here I'll just highlight what we are. We're not gonna be using AC, all the stuff that runs underneath the bumper. We're gonna pull out uh, the factory air box and uh, we'll talk about the brake lines when we get to that point. That rear motor mount, we're not gonna be using cool. either. We pretty much got the bay prepped for our motor. Uh, you know, if you're not familiar with exactly how things come apart like this bumper right here, it could be a little tricky if you've never done it before. You know, the first engine that I removed, I used a Haynes and Chilton manual. You know, I think I was like 20, 21 when I did that. It took me 19 hours just to get the engine out, but that had a lot to do with the, with the kind of tools that I had. I went and got the Craftsman, like 260 uh, piece kit. I don't know, cost a few hundred bucks. I thought I had everything. Well, I soon found out that there are other tools out there that make the job easier. The reason I'm talking about that is I got a cool tool that I haven't used in one of my videos before. This right here is an impact swivel socket. It's pretty rad. You know, these is a set by Snap-on. I think just about everybody makes them, but uh, this makes getting to that rear motor mount pretty easy. You know, when I was a young kid, many of these tools I bought while I was still pretty young, but if you look at my socket set here, I couldn't afford a full socket. So I bought just the sizes that I needed. 12, 14, 17, 19, and then the longer ones too. This set right here probably took me maybe a few years to be able to acquire. You know, when I started the internet was pretty new and buying stuff online, pretty much wasn't existent as far as I was concerned. You know, we still had to send checks in and wait for our stuff to come in the mail. You know, right when I got into acquiring my tools, I just learned that I loved tools. My first job was with Autoglass. I started at 18 years old. I didn't know anything about cars. I was hired by um, my uncle's friend and he taught me how to do glass. That's what got me into cars and he was all about the tools. So I spent a lot of time on the Snap-on truck. This socket was really cool when I needed to get into a, a spot where I needed a, a, a wobbly, but then these extensions came out by Snap-on. So if you look really close here, it's just like any other extension, except that it's got this weird fixed head here. Right, so you're gonna put your socket on the end of it and it's just like any extension But if you pull just about halfway through Then it becomes a swivel and you can see how less thick it is than this socket here Right, so this is gonna help us get to that back mount because this is a little bit too thick to get back there Because race car, we're gonna be removing the stock exhaust and uh, when we put the engine in here, we're just gonna finish it off with a header. Talk to the customer and he's going to eventually turbo it. So if we build an exhaust line based off a header that we're gonna put back there, then it could be just a, a wasted exhaust line. During that same conversation, he did express to me that he does want heat in this car, which is something we didn't do on budget EF. So that would be another great addition to this video to show you how we're gonna make that work with our K-Series engine. Now we're gonna be working on the passenger side motor mount. That thing's gonna to have to be drilled out. How to do that will refer to the budget EF. We need to remove that so that we can place this new bracket in there. This is what's gonna hold the passenger side motor mount on our K-Series and it's gonna mount somewhere in this area. Either way, it interferes with that guy and this wouldn't be able to fit there with the engine Anyways, the engine sits really tight up against the shock tower and that would just be total interference. But before we weld this on, we're going to sand off the surface rust and then apply this, this zinc primer here. What's cool about this is it will, it is a primer keeping this rust free, especially in the back where we won't be able to paint. This is actually weldable. If you look right through, it says weld through zinc rich primer. One of the problems with painting something to keep it rust free is you can't weld on it. So you'll have to grind down the area exposing raw metal. With that stuff, you could apply it on both sides and weld right through it. I'm just gonna show you what uh, our mount removal looked like. And uh, that's probably the cleanest job I've done. We ended up using an 
impact drill. There's one here I'll show you. It's called a quarter inch impact. It's called a quarter inch hex impact gun and it's by Milwaukee. They also have some drill bits that I use. I like using the impact drills uh, because it really just penetrates pretty well right through the material there. This is what it looks like and these are the bits. And the, they do have a tip right there so uh, it reduces walking and it does a really great job. It doesn't penetrate like other drill bits do. It's going to just wipe out the material uh, that it needs to right around the spot weld and it did a pretty good job I did make one mistake and I did get through but because I have a welder I'm gonna go ahead and fill this stuff in and then grind it down I did take a scotch brite to this to prepare it for the paint this stuff does coat very well you'll see how it covers pretty quick you know with just a, a couple of strokes here and it does dry very fast too so what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll get this one coat on there and then I'll let it dry and then I'll come back and do one more coat. And what I'm looking for is just to see that uh, all that surface stuff that you saw there as far as rust goes is covered and nothing's bleeding through. I wanted to show you what could happen if you didn't take that extra step as far as zinc coating. This is a swap we did about 10 years ago. You can see we keep it very clean. Here you can see what happens if you don't take that extra step. Rust gets behind there and then starts billowing up over. I'm gonna take the car outside and do a pressure wash, hose this whole bay down so at least it looks good while we're working on it. And I also have to do some work on this. Since we're going to be welding back there, it obviously needs to be cleaned. And I could take a grinder right to it right now, but what that could do is shove some of this dirt and oil into the, into the metal even more, making for an ugly weld. Not too bad. You know, there's uh, still a few rough spots, you know, that we could probably, that will probably end up getting cleaned up over time. There are some things that we're gonna be moving around, but I'm leaving them in the place so that you can see what we're going to be doing with those later on and the reasons why we'd wanna move them to begin with. With the car in the shop now, we're gonna be focusing on two things. We're gonna be filling in these holes and then we're gonna take a flat disc, sand a flat disc and sand it smooth and then prep this area for our bracket here. This is the new part that's gonna go in place of the one that we just removed. And it's gonna sit somewhere in here, but you don't have to guess. There's actually some locating holes using pre-existing threaded bosses in the, in the frame. You'll be using some bolts to align it where it needs to be and uh, then you can pull the bolts out. Those bolts will not be strong enough to hold them out on its own. This, I'm gonna be using this Hobart welder here. It's a 110, it's very simple. It was actually relatively inexpensive for what it is. I believe the unit was about 700 bucks and I believe it came with the torque, with the torch. You know, having a welder along with your tool arsenal is absolutely awesome. There's so many applications you can use for this. Those came out quite better than I thought they would. I was just trying to cover, uh, just fill in the holes. They're not very tall and we should be able to knock that down pretty well. Now this part isn't particularly necessary, welding in those, you know, but I was showing you this because if you accidentally drilled all the way through, then you would have holes like that just all around here, Swiss cheese. You know, it, this isn't very easy to take off. You do have to take your time and uh, welding those in would definitely strengthen the area. But we did it just because we wanted to make it look like that we had tried. Uh, any other things that would hang up uh, with the bracket here could impede the how this bracket actually will bolt to you want it on there just like it's supposed to be because that's how your engines gonna going to mount you know if this was 
angled out at some point and I'm being exact I'm exaggerating here but then that means the motor would be the motor mount would twist in there and let's just get it right so now I'm gonna go over I'm gonna go over it with the flap disc here and take break down most of the sand here and I'm using that because it's basically a sander that's what there's those those are a little tiny sand little bits of sandpaper put together on a wheel it works really well for knocking stuff like this down without digging too much into the steel you know if you were to use a grinder you would have a bunch of grind marks in there We'll use some 220 here, uh, and that's gonna smooth out the area. Now, we're not gonna try to paint the whole bay, but we are gonna uh, scuff some of the areas where some overspray will lay, and we wanna make sure that it lays down. We'll probably hit this up over here with some 80 grit, and then maybe another 220 on top of that. If we really wanted to get nice, we could polish it up with some 600 before we lay some paint down. We'll see how it goes. They're smoothed down pretty good. I got it blended in with the other paint here on through the other sides. You saw I hit it with the grinder, then I hit it with some 80 grit. I did it by hand, uh, not a set using a sanding block because many of this stuff has contours that a flat surface sanding block won't work. If any of you guys have ever shaved a bay, you pretty much have to do it by hand. You can't really use any power tools in here. Everything, there are so many different contours and you're just not gonna be able to get into it. It takes a lot of work to be able to, to shave and tuck a bay correctly. So you can see where we did our welding and some grinding. It pretty much mimics what the factory spot welds look like. So it looks OE and I'm really happy with how that came out. It's all wiped up now and I end up using some paint thinner. That's really gonna break down all the, the dirt, grease, and paint that's left over here and make it a really nice slick surface for us to put our first coat of zinc. The zinc coating here is pretty cool. It's working as our, our primer, so we're gonna be able to prime this whole area here. The paint's gonna stick to it and we're gonna be able to weld to it. It's gonna protect all our stuff. It lays in thick, so it's gonna fill in all those other cracks and crevices pretty well here that might be left over by the sanding material. The zinc covers really, really well. That was just one coat. I'm gonna go over at least one more time. And you here can see that I didn't really mask anything off, and that's for one reason. I do have color matched paint here that was mixed up by Sherwin Williams. This is a, a single stage frost white. A lot of automotive paint shops can actually mix the color paint that you want to match the car directly in an aerosol can. So that's something that we made uh, for actually that white car that we showed you with all the rust. We had the can made afterwards, of course. And of course we found out about the zinc stuff after that car was built also. Now, when we were kids, I'd float it over here. And that's the technique that we named the Dustin Hoffman. One of my buddies was a painter and he would talk about dusting paint, a technique that he learned in school. Well, when he says, hey, I gotta dust this area, I named it the Dustin Hoffman. That's While the zinc's drying, we'll go ahead and work on the weld-in part that goes in the back cross member. We gotta prep the cross member, but first we have to mark it. This guy, this is a weld-on part, which is why it's not powder coated. Where that's gonna go is this rear bracket here. Now remember, these engines were never meant to be in a CRX, and so what they're trying to do is just make it easier for you when you wanna put that thing into a car that's never supposed to have it. The, these are the only holes that you can grab, and then it has to stretch all the way over here. There is known to be movement in this thing, and some guys are just welding this directly onto the rear subframe. If you wanted to be able to remove this, you could without welding this completely on because of this update that you'll see here. This part will weld to the subframe, and then this part will go on top of that, and then they'll sandwich together. Just take one of the bolts out of the hardware kit that you got there and tighten it onto the bracket and try to align it uh, next to the other one because that's how it needs to fit. So you can see that it's actually shaped just like, uh, just like the bracket is. And then you'll see how it wraps around underneath. And that's the part that's gonna get welded to the rear cross member just like that.
the bracket is now mounted on our rear cross member and you can see that I put all four bolts in there you know this is going to be a stationary part now you know so this is important that you get all the bolts and aligned where you need to be because once we weld that we can't move it so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a sharpie and mark it in this area right here and as many spots as I can reach so that it ends up right where I need it matter of fact it would probably be best if I just tack it. So what I'm gonna do now, is now that I have an idea where it needs to be, I'm going to mark it and then sand down the area. I'll probably hit it with some zinc again, then weld it and then, uh, and then I could paint it afterwards. I think that's probably gonna be the best course of action. It sanded and Dustin Hoffman with some zinc. We're gonna go ahead and now bolt this back on there and uh, prepare for our weld. Bolt this back on nice and tight and we'll weld in place and this is it. All right, make sure you get it right. Now that it's tacked into place, I'm going to see how well this uh, new bracket will come off with it tacked there. Hopefully this will stay and the rest of the bracket will move and then we'll be able to weld it completely on. It stayed in place and you see what we got to do here. Now we have three points that we can capture this side this side and this side now you'll see that there is a lip that goes on the back side if you wanted to get crazy and try to weld that you could possibly remove this whole deal to get that taken care of uh, you know if that concerned you We'll clean this up and then uh, we'll color match paint. All right, this is going to be another one of those sides that we want that we want to make sure that it's positioned correctly. Those are the two bolt holes they have you capture. We have those good and tight. And according to Hosport, we only need to stitch weld this on. We don't need to weld completely around it. And we'll start in a couple of areas, maybe down here on the bottom, uh, to test to see if my gas or my wire speeds correctly. And then we and hopefully got it figured out by the time we move into the areas that are seen. So you saw that, that was a much cleaner weld. You can tell when it starts welding really well is it doesn't make that popping sound. It's really smooth sounding. And of course you can see that it's less dirty here, right? So it was a combination of a few things. My wire speed, the heat range, and uh, the gas. This was my settings on my whole bar right here. And that was my guess, but I think what I wasn't paying attention to was that the cooler is on. The cooler's right above me, and I think that was blowing all my gas away. I think that's what happened in the back there, and that's what happened underneath there. So at least the welds on top are super clean. There's almost no porosity in there at all. You'll notice right away when it starts popping like popcorn, and sometimes that's what it looks like too. I went ahead and threw another coat of uh, zinc right on top of the welds. I do want uh, our paint to stick to it pretty well and 
the weld itself could have burned off some of the zinc and I want to make sure that everything is coated well. Look at the color difference. Isn't that crazy? All right, so now some of the silver could be bleeding through. We still have a couple of more coats to go through, but like as we're getting closer, you could see the differences between the color. And now it's like, well, are you sure that's the same color? Is this car frost white? Well, if you look at the can, look what it reads on it right there, right? Frost white. Now let's go look at the engine code. Let's go look at the color code, NH538. That's just how yellow this paint has gotten over the years. There's not a whole lot we could do. We did our best to match it, and uh, that's the result. Not too bad. Look at it. Yeah, it came up pretty good. All right, so that paint right there is called the economical overall fast drying enamel. And uh, as you can see, it's a good match for our rear cross member. It looks very OEM with the satin color there. As I was getting started to add all the bolts here, I thought that it would probably be a good idea just to go ahead and put a bolt through here too while we're tightening this. That's gonna help align this bracket back where it needed to be where we welded that part to. Now that the rear bracket's on, now is probably a good time to test the alignment. What we want, what we were doing was making sure that our bolt is going to go through both brackets through the mount on the other side. Now that's going to make things nice knowing that that's going to work out after we get our engine in here. We don't have to mess around back there. Okay, so I believe that we're ready now to put the engine in. Um, I think this transmission is going to need some notching in the back. Matter and uh, once I drop the engine down in there, then I'll know. We are going to drop it traditionally. I could take off the transfer cases, which is something I might do just to be able to help me swing it under there. I don't know. It's rather large and it's got to do a whole lot of maneuvering just to get into the bay anyways. It's a big engine for that car and uh, the transfer case comes off pretty easily. Uh, I'll show you how that's done and then we'll go ahead and drop it in place. We have the engine hoist attached to the engine and I think this is pretty much going to be a traditional drop-in like most of you at home. You know, what's, there's a cool story about this lift right here. Um, I believe it was er, the early 2000s. I brought this home from the AutoZone. It, I believe it was right, at, right when I was getting ready to do my very first swap. I needed an engine hoist. I brought it home and the, my daughter's mother was pretty upset at me. She looked at me and was all kinds of mad and said, you know, what are you going to use that one time? You're never going to use it again or something like that. I can't count how many engines I've used with this. You know, tools always pay back. We're going to be removing the hood on this car. Uh, the way that the engine drops down, it will interfere with the hood. I'm gonna need as much room as possible. Uh, not a big deal, but what I was going to show you is how to pull this off by yourself. You know, there's a whole history to why I work in the shop by myself and why I don't have a lift. Maybe one day we'll get there, but I'm gonna be like the majority of you that may not have friends that are able to help you, or I'll show you what I do to get the hood off by myself. We're gonna pay close attention because the hood might wanna fall down. It might puncture through the cowl onto the windshield. All right, you don't wanna buy a new window if you don't need one. And you notice that you started on that side first while the hood prop is holding up the hood. As I lift up, I'm going to pay very close attention to the other side, making sure it doesn't slide around. And 
the same on this side. The hood is going to want to drop and you're going to pay close attention to where it ends up. So now that the hood is completely detached from the hinges, I'm just going to shut it like I normally would with them attached. We could take a look inside there and it looks so clean, right? Demographically speaking, the original owners of these all-wheel drive transmissions were your older groups, families, older people most likely. Those vehicles weren't something that most enthusiasts were after. It's not like these were a B16 or a GSR engine where you'd have to worry about how many miles were on them or, or how many hits and grinds they've done in all the gears. The engine's hovering over our motor bay here and you could just see how huge that thing is, right? It is a big engine. That engine obviously was never designed to be inside a CRX. So we're trying to squeeze something huge into something small to make it fast. And uh, you know, there's just gonna be a lot of things that we're gonna have to do to make that happen. This tool right here will let me turn the engine uh, to where I can tilt it and drop the, the back tail of the transmission down inside the bay and then we'll be able to drop this mount into the part that we welded earlier. Now I stopped it about halfway just so you can see what's going on here. All right, you notice that I took off the underdrive pulley. That's gonna give us a lot more clearance here. Uh, you saw that I used an impact gun here. This one's a, this one's a 1400 foot pound by Milwaukee. If you don't have one of these, I highly suggest one. You will not be disappointed. I'd like you to take a close look at the clearance we have with it unbolted. Look, it, it's gonna barely clear there. It was a good idea that we took it off. Over here, our transmission's gonna clear our rail pretty, pretty easily. We do have some wiggle room to maneuver. I think it's gonna go pretty well. There was one thing I forgot to mention. If you were watching the budget EF K-series swap, you will saw in that video that we moved uh, these brake lines. That is something I'm gonna have to move out of the way. Like I was telling you earlier, the valve cover sits right here, so I'm gonna have to just move that out of the way. We're gonna address this at, in another episode so you understand what we're gonna be doing. Before we get too far ahead, I just want to show what we did. Now we dropped that, that side engine mount in and then to get it in place and rock the engine in pretty much the angle that we need, we set this jack up under there lifting up the transmission. 
we set the transmission, then we were able to rock the engine in place. You know, the K-Series leans back quite a bit and uh, it just looks odd when you're doing the swap for the first time. Now, we have it set up on the highest point here. This point right here, I believe, was the original location that Haasport designed their, K their K20 kit to. We're not too worried about overall height because this will eventually be a race car. There's going to be a special hood we're going to put on this where there, where Haasport's kit was originally designed to. It was an SIR style hood designed for a USDM headlights. That hood has been discontinued, but that is going to change. We'll show you what one of those hoods look like in a few more episodes. Make sure to watch how we're going to get this, this engine to fit under a hood. However, being that this is the dual height kit, we are opting for the higher settings because we do have the shorter block. And this right here is their foot mount. This is a patented part here that they use on many, many of the motor mount kits now. When you look at it, you can see the offset tab. One direction, the tab is up. The other, rec, the other direction, the tab is down. That's going to be your height differences right there. Now I explained that I like to keep all my brackets and mounts loose, that's gonna help us align everything uh, without too much struggle. So that's what we're gonna do now. We'll add these three bolts here, and then this one, keeping everything loose. With both side mounts installed, we can now drop the cherry picker and the jack. We still have the rear bracket to work with. guys it's in we covered a lot today we covered the brand new well done additional bracket which helps support the rear subframe bracket then we have the rear engine bracket which is updated with the new 12 by 125 bolt for some extra rigidity if you take a close look at how much room we have with the transmission now we got a lot of clearance actually we have a lot of clearance over here on the transmission side and frame rail. And uh, if you look right here, we do too. Now the underdrive pulley is still off. In some future episodes, we'll see, you'll see what we're gonna do with that area down there. So I believe that's gonna conclude this episode this time. I appreciate you guys watching. Make sure to subscribe. Make sure to check out our website at hushperformance.com. Any of the things you saw featured here will be available on our website. It'll also be a clickable link down below. We're going to create a playlist right here on our YouTube channel. We'll call it the EF All Wheel Drive How To. It'll be an entire series, that's where I'll play it so that you can play it from start to beginning without having to fish through our entire channel looking for it. Guys, thank you very much, and like always, happy tuning.